Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to everybody joining us from across the world uh, once again. Thank you very much um, for joining our penultimate uh, webinar in our Light Lunch series. Um, thank you to everyone that's tuned in over the last few weeks. It's been phenomenally successful. Thank you to everybody who's given us some feedback. We've definitely learned as we've gone along, and the music has definitely got worse uh, as we've gone, uh, gone along, so um, I apologize for that. Um, just a couple of reminders, you'll see in the sticky notes at the very top of the chat box, um, there is a link to our YouTube channel, which has got all of the previous six um, uh, webinars uploaded. This one will be uploaded uh, later on this week as well. Um, and obviously on um, the 11th of May, we have Martin Valentine joining us for Magic Movie Moment, which is an amazing uh, and really fun uh, webinar. So if you like movies, if you like lighting or design, and you want some incredible anecdotes for what goes on off camera, uh, then please do join us 12.30 British Summer Time on the 11th of May. Um, and then finally, you'll also see in the sticky note thing, which I think should be kind of there, you look at me, um, you'll, there's also a link to our competition, um, Light Up Your Lockdown. You can win one of three Mathmos uh, lava lamps. So um, please do have a look at it. There's been a wonderful reception so far to it um all you need to do is uh hashtag uh light up your lockdown and at multi lighting on instagram um enter it who knows you might win um so that's probably enough plugging from me today um i will uh now hand over to Carolyn and emilio who've got a really interesting uh webinar uh, to give on um, a manifesto for a good night's sleep uh, there's a lot of um detailed information in this please do um ask any questions uh, you've got me moderating, uh, God help you, so um, I will be laughing today. Uh, I shall say no more. Kale, Emilio, floor is yours, over to you. Uh, enjoy. Thank you very much, Paul. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, so why, why are we studying sleep? Let's just start with that. It's something that we all do. It's something that we all probably do pretty poorly, to be honest. When was the last time you woke up and felt, oh, God, that was amazing. I got so much sleep. Rarely? On a Saturday, if you're lucky. So what we do has a lot to do with sleep. I mean, light affects sleep. Every part of design affects sleep, but lighting designers, so we'll get into our bit. Um, and there's more and more projects that we've done where wellness and looking at sort of the whole experience of a person throughout the day really does change how they interact with the environment. So we figured, let's talk about sleep while we talk about light. Yeah, I mean, we want to start by covering a few case studies of different things as light designers we're we're not claiming to be experts and everything but as Kel said we're increasingly being asked to look at different aspects of design and and wellness in people's uh, projects uh, and just uh, a few examples here with uh, the wellness clinic in Harrods very sumptuous feel but there's medical procedures taking place here uh, medical grade lighting in terms of color rendering and you know the sort of cleanliness uh, were, were needed so it's, uh, it's something we have to really look into. Uh, you know, if you're performing a procedure and you need to identify blood vessels, then, you know, this is really critical. You've got the right quality of light. So, again, quite a steep learning curve for us on that. Uh, we've also, uh, in, in the past, uh, my colleagues uh, Anna Sandgood and Claire Hamill uh, did some work with Zicato uh, and Clinique to work on a, a lighting module that was specifically rendered to bring out certain skin tones uh, and uh, in a realistic manner rather than just in a complementary manner and again that just required us learning about certain technical aspects of light uh, and lighting design uh, that are people focused uh, last example here which uh, many of you won't be a stranger to is the green wall and uh, this is again an increasing occurrence in lots of lots of our projects and things like the well standard promote this uh, and again having to understand the, the effect of different wavelengths of light for root growth or root stability and which wavelengths promote flowering uh, it's, it's quite important for us to be able to make sure we can keep the damn thing alive really so as we move on uh, we we found we were asked, being asked more and more to look at, uh, in certain in hospitality, uh, making use of deep land spaces. Uh, and in hotels, that often means rooms without windows with very limited access to light. And something which uh, certainly in marketing suites and hotels that comes up quite often is the use of a light box. Uh, here we can see a couple of examples, and they're not particularly 
uh, convincing perhaps because they're just a, a kind of light box with a graphic printed on it. And there's lots of reasons this, you know, it doesn't really convince the eye or the mind that it's actually a, a window or something which, uh, you know, can engage uh, the eye because as you move around it, it doesn't, obviously the point of uh, focus in the distance doesn't change as we're asked to pump more light through the particular image to make it feel like daylight's flooding a space, you end up with green light and uh, sort of any certain frequencies of light coming into the space, which isn't great for color rendering. And we were asked by Premier Inn on a, a relatively short turnaround project to look at this in a bit more detail. Uh, so we decided to take a slightly different approach and use the, the, the sort of create that uh, convincing sense of depth of field uh, and using color tone rather than trying to have a, a particular image or backdrop of, a, of, of one city. Uh, and obviously being designers, we're inspired by, uh, by art, so you know, a bit Torellian on it, and looking at the, the way that we can sort of suspend the disbelief of how, how deep a particular pocket is and draw the eye through into it. And here's a couple of mock-up photos showing how we could create a sense of uh, different qualities of light to represent morning and evening. And again, we we weren't really at the time that sure why we were doing it. We just uh, we wanted to create a sense of, of of dusk to kind of connect that room to uh, a quality of light that it might have received in in the day to day uh, life if it actually had a window, perhaps through a sheer curtain or something similar. And then just a little exploded view of the product. So it, you know the project was over pretty quickly. It actually left us probably posing more questions than, than answers, and it really uh, really made us think, you know, what is the impact of light uh, in hotel rooms? How are we actually going to use this to enhance sleep rather than just to create a, a slightly better version of a light box? So something we realized, <clears throat> as I mentioned out the back of that, is we were lacking guidance. We, we kind of looked around at the standards that we have available to us in design guides. Um, there's a lot of conflicting information uh, for the design community, best practice, the, the impact of light. Um, I think lighting bodies at the moment feel the need to perhaps abstain uh, from having a really firm position on, on, on design guidance for sleep and uh, the you know, how we should uh, implement uh, lighting to impact the circadian cycle. So that's one thing which we're aware of. And if you think about it, it's, it's being used in care homes offices and hospitality for, for different effects, but it's the same system in our body that we're impacting. Um, and then also we got looking at how we consume light throughout the day, our exposure to light uh, and our behavior. Uh, this also interestingly led us to uh, link up with a company called LIST that some of you may have heard of. Uh, LIST provide a, a little button with a spectrometer in it which reads the quantity and quality of light that you receive throughout the course of the day um, and that's been a really interesting process in-house we've, we've dished them out to a couple of people in the studio to see what their quality is and, and an interesting statistic from them is actually a bigger influence on how much light your light diet if you like how much light you see throughout the day than where in the world you live is the type of job you do or even how close you sit to a window in your job so if you're a light designer in Miami or Dubai or in, in gloomy London uh, not that gloomy today but uh, throughout the winter then uh, you, you know actually you're going to be exposed to similar levels of light uh, and again that impacts our diet and of light and that impacts our circadian rhythm so um, you know the factors that affect it that are linked to light and the control of that was something that we, you know, we, we sort of understood we need to do a lot more research into. Um, so before we get into all of this, and Amelia touched on kind of a couple of things that we'll get into later, but before we had the built environment, what was our light diet like? Well, we woke up when it was light outside and we worked throughout the day and then we stopped working when it was dark. That was it, that was all we had. Capturing and harnessing fire took a very long time for us to sort out and then the electric lighting didn't come around until the 20 in the Sorry, the 19th century So we throughout the evolution as humans We are not used to electric lighting and manipulating it in the way that we do now So let's see how quickly these changes have happened and what it's done to us as people yeah, Absolutely, so you know a couple hundred years ago with the advent of the Industrial Revolution our relationship with uh, artificial light changed massively uh, and all of a sudden we can work shift patterns 
uh, and that didn't take very long for people to call on to in terms of productivity. And in this image, you can see within the workshop, electric light still very expensive um, to, to kind of achieve. So during the day, natural light was relied upon, but at night and for night shifts uh, already, we've made a very quick change from, uh, you know, from having a very red diurnal lifestyle where we're, uh, we're kind of dictated to by the, the amount of daylight and the, what we can achieve during daylight hours. Uh, to to this scenario and then <clears throat> we move on again with another sort of social economic shift if you like uh, post-war where all of a sudden people have a lot more spare time uh, on their hands and uh, you know you can see here that there's a culture uh, change so uh, people are you know economically and a bit more free uh, they've got more spare time on their hands and now we're starting to uh, to exist outside of work after hours in environments with much more light and much greater sort of spectrum of qualities of light and quantities of light. So this is quite a big impact on uh, on our bodies uh, with uh, you know, a relatively short window of time. So we've not had any time to sort of adjust to this uh, sort of physiologically. And you know, the, the sort of move from there on our relationship with productivity, probably in the early 2000s, uh, a lot of you will probably remember the uh, the advent of lights with a, a little blue spike and using control of light to manage the the post lunch dip as it was known so we're you know even 20 years ago or so we were looking at using light in the workplace to enhance people's productivity uh, without really much regard for you know what impact that might have on us later in the day And so a relationship with light and well-being is something that's even newer than that. I think with the advent of lead and well and fit well and all of these other kind of qualifications that we're now going for, it's more in the mind of every person who's designing. It's not just specialists that are go looking at built environments and saying, oh, we need to do something here. And, you know, even personal practices where, you know, we've got now yoga and mindfulness and all of these kinds of things is that people are more aware kind of of the whole of our day and how light affects us. I think that it's, it's definitely becoming easier to track. As Amelia said, we, a lot of us wore these buttons and we were very concerned as to where we had spikes during our day. I mean, going on the tube or the train was just absolutely mind blowing. I think we all know how we feel taking public transport after a very long day at work. It just destroys you. So I think we're, <laughs> we're all getting more and more aware as how this kind of changes our whole day and changes how we interact with each other and then how it affects the next day. Um, so with that, we've done a lot of research for the purposes of looking at hotel environments, but also just kind of for our own knowledge. Um, so there's a lot of different places you can get information from, um, some of them more detrimental than others, as everyone has an opinion. Um, but there has been a series of academic studies which are specifically focusing on light and sleep. Most of them have to do with um, care homes and hospitals in how you need to expose patients to light and how you should have the transition of light between patient rooms and corridors and nurse staffing areas, uh, as well as for shift workers. So working in factories, do you give um, workers sunglasses to wear when they leave the factory at a certain time of day so that they can more better um, acclimate to what their day looks like, even if it's not where a normal circadian rhythm would be. And a lot of the lighting bodies also published white paper and then further yet, we've got news articles in The Telegraph and The Guardian and so on and so forth that are kind of cherry picking these little pieces of information to let the wider community know that there's a lot of uh, research on sleep and that we're not getting enough. Yeah, the, the, I suppose the issue we sort of noted with news articles is that they, they do tend to oversimplify uh, yeah. you know, the, their, their opinion on things. And, and even, um, you know, we look at uh, Matthew Walker's book on why we sleep, which hopefully a lot of people have, have possibly listened to that have been tuned in today uh, or read if you've got a bit more stamina <laughs> than me and um, you know that's got hugely detailed information on on sleep but uh, with regards to lighting it's quite oversimplified and it really just says that you know we should cut out led lights in the bedroom without really moving into that in more detail um, we've also held panel talks with uh, with interior designers uh, controls um, specialists and project managers to just to get their view on you know what's what what their sort of understanding and experience of uh, designing lighting for hospitality is, 
Uh, and, and certainly something that we'll talk about a bit later that came up a lot was controls, because I think that is probably one of the most subjective uh, components with regards to how we think about controlling of light, even though technically, you know, there's lots of ways it can be done and it seems quite straightforward uh, in terms of the technology that we have. Uh, I think it's more about that human interaction. Uh, and there's also lots of opinion pieces, which are, you know, sort of user experience of hotel rooms. And again, they can be quite subjective. So we're just trying to take all of this information in and then aggregate it into something that, um, that we could find useful. Um, just to pick up on what Kel was mentioned about the, the academic studies, they're probably largely split into sort of sociology, uh, so physiology, and psychology. And uh, I think you know that's also worth bearing in mind that, that they're quite you know, sociological impacts could be uh, you know perhaps one study that comes to mind is the, a U.S. and Korean citizen uh, sort of looking at specific uh, taste trends in how a particular render of a hotel room was lit, and then showing that to uh, a range of different people in Korea and the US and trying to get build up a picture of what those cultural preferences were. And there are certain trends that, again, we'll, we'll touch on a bit later, um, that we are led to believe exist in certain areas. But again, that's they're, they're quite sort of generalizations. Um, in terms of physiology, we'll be talking about uh, the sort of endocrinologists, uh, the, you know, the hormonal effect uh, of uh, of light on the body and there's a bit of new research on that at the moment with um, uh, DLMO which is a dim light melatonin onset and it, psychologically I think again really important if we're not getting good sleep it affects memory retention uh, it can sort of link to depression and our, our ability to focus so they're all um, and there's a lot of information there to digest and try and give we're trying to look at how we can give that a practical application so then what do we know? Um, so from all this research and from the work that we have been doing on hotels, so we know that color and color uh, correlated color temperature have a lot to do with how we perceive light. So obviously different wavelengths affect us in different ways. The amount of light that we get during the day and the kind of color that is coming in so we know about blue lighting and red lighting at day and night and how that affects us specifically because of those wavelengths is that it doesn't take very much as far as lux levels go for certain wavelengths to affect us. Um, so we have to be even more conscious about that in times of day when we are meant to be not getting as much light exposure or could potentially get too much. And the direction and quantity is that we have evolved to have lighting from above, is that we've evolved to having the light above us when, well, if you're not, you know, in the northern hemisphere, way, way up there where it's dark a lot of the year. So for the rest of us, we are used to having, you know, a sunrise and a sunset that has a directionality to it and a quantity of it that we are getting on a pretty regular medium pace. So the body isn't evolved to have low level task lighting and to have, you know, the kind of things that we have now with electric lighting. I think also with, uh, you know, just looking at this image, uh, I mean, it's, it's beautiful in terms of direction and quantity of light. Um, but the eye is also <clears throat> in its most relaxed state when looking at, at green as a color. And that's, you know, that's perhaps not a surprise when we think about the, you know, the sort of materials that surrounded us in the environment we've, we've evolved in. I think in terms of quantity of light, uh, there's there's a little bit of um, mixed messaging out there when you look at it. To, to have a, a melanopic effect on our on our body and to impact our circadian cycle, uh, we're looking at levels of between 500 and 1500 lux um, as a minimum to, to actually uh, you know have a, a change in the, the measured levels of uh, melatonin. But uh, we can be disrupted in our sleep cycle by much, much lower levels of light. And uh, you know, if you think about how we have different types of uh, photopic and scotopic vision within the eye that allow us to see better at night, and then it sort of blends using both parts of the day. And then when it's bright, uh, you know, we rely on uh, the uh, scotopic. But it's, I mean, it's just worth noting that when we have, when we are sort of in a sort of nighttime scenario, a very, very small level of between five lux um, or, you know, as low as five lux can actually disrupt how we sleep. But it's not, it's not having a kind of hormonal impact on us necessarily. So we look at the eye in a bit more detail uh, and the anatomy, as, as Kale said, um, 
the, uh, the, the lower portion of the eye is the bit that's most sensitive, uh, has the highest density of what we call the ganglion cells. Now, we've known for a while that, you know, rods and cones exist and what they do. And in 2001, in, uh, in Jefferson College in the US, a group of scientists discovered the, uh, the or discovered in inverted commas, the, the ganglion cells and that they had a non-visual uh, component, which meant that they triggered certain hormonal responses in the body. But uh, the subject was unable to necessarily see that. This was tested in uh, blind mice. If anyone's got any questions as to how they discovered that, but um, the you know that as as we mentioned, that we've evolved for light to come from above, and so it's no surprise you know, above or from about forty five degrees up from the horizon. So it's no surprise there that the highest density of these uh, these particular cells that impact our uh, sleep um, sort of cycle are located in the bottom of the eye. So I just want to talk about this graph for a little bit. I think it's worth dwelling on, which is our uh, sleep stress cycle. So the, the human body reacts to shifts in light and colour temperature of daylight, taking its cues from, from hormone production. Um, the two hormones that we're talking about a lot, so stress hormone, which is cortisol, and melatonin, which is the sort of relaxing hormone, which makes us feel sleepy, which is here in, in green. Um, now, in an adult uh, sort of human from about three or four in the morning onwards we start to naturally produce increased levels of cortisol and this, this stress hormone leads us to wake up it also uh, does things like raises our blood pressure increase, increases circulation so all of these uh, this is all part of a wider cycle and this causes us to gradually feel more alert and then we'll wake up typically um, as the sun rises now left without any input from natural light this would most, most people should form a sort of 25-hour cycle, which seems a little bit odd, given that our planet you know, revolves um, on a 24-hour cycle. But uh, that that kind of play, uh, that sort of shift that we can we, that we have to be able to tweak that 25 hours down to lower or higher uh, quantities enables us to deal with you know, seasonal changes and our environment. And so that's where light comes in, and that's where light kind of trims and tunes the, the precise times that these hormones are um, released and also uh, suppressed. And you can see here. The where... do... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> you can see here the dotted line that our alertness levels follow shortly after cortisol. So it's, it's quite important that you know if you think about when we're likely to be most awake and most productive, it's going to be at the peaks of these dotted lines here. So I'm just important to note is that if you are drinking alcohol or caffeine, that dotted line and the um, melatonin is going to shift. So what you're doing when you drink caffeine or when you drink alcohol is that you are suppressing that part of your hormonal system, telling you that it's time to go to sleep. So really, all it's doing is delaying where that peak is. So it's not shortening it. It's not making it any less necessary for your body but you're effectively just pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. That's why we all get a crash from caffeine is that suddenly your body's gone, oh, I'm no longer being suppressed anymore. And you def you feel that just drop in you. And with alcohol as well, alcohol makes sleep worse for you. It's that you're not, when you pass out, you're not really sleeping. Your body's just going into a stasis. So actually this, this is in the perfect day where you don't have any caffeine after three o'clock and you might've had a cheeky pie at lunch, but you haven't had anything after that. So it's really important to consider your whole day when you're thinking about this is everything you put in your body and everything you do to it can shift around when these hormonal balances change. Yeah, actually, that reminds me when we um, we did a little bit of work last year with uh, Imperial College. Uh, they're looking at the uh, dim light melatonin onset, which I, I mentioned and I'll touch on again when looking at this. But one of the students there was in his final year and he asked me, how much light do I need to expose myself to and what quality in order to be able to stay alert for longer? in order to to work harder but obviously that there is the answer to that is is don't do that um you know it is a cycle and at some point as kale said you can prolong it but it will it will crash and it does need to cycle so uh you know and the, the side effects of pushing that are things like you know in, increased blood pressure uh it, you know we need the downtime in order to process sugars so it can, can cause or be linked to diabetes for example uh if we you know if we kind of prolong that process so there's physiologically, there's lots of negative side effects. And this sleep cycle is an important part of what we do. And lighting is a, is a primary driver in it. Um, but it's not the only reason we do it is not just to stay awake uh, and be alert. You know, it's kind of lots of other factors around it.
Mm-hmm. And just on the dim light melatonin onset, there's uh, a school of thought at the moment. Um, obviously, we talk about blue light in the middle of the day, creating a, a kind of peak in our alertness. Whereas uh, towards the uh, the latter part of the day, um, you know, the recommendations are, and Kel will touch on this in a bit, is to reduce the amount of quantity of light and the amount of blue light that we have. Uh, the research that's being undertaken at the moment uh, in a couple of places, but Imperial College is one of them, is uh, whether or not a specific wavelength of amber light uh, triggers the release of melatonin. So instead of just thinking about using blue light to enhance our alertness, uh, we may be able to consider the use of amber light to uh, increase the release of melatonin or to trigger the release of melatonin to ha- help us feel sleepy. So This is what a day would look like if we didn't have any artificial lighting, if we stood outside and we just enjoyed nature. So I think we all pretty much know this graph. We have sunrise, middle of the day and sunset. Fine. This this is what it's meant to be like. This is kind of how how much of these different color temperatures are meant to be exposed to and into what degree. Now, our normal day looks more like this. So that curve in the dashed line is where we're meant to be with a natural day cycle and then, you know, just the peaks of kind of what daily life looks like. Now, I do recognize that this graph does not accurately represent the current situation where we all are all working from home and hopefully we have a lot more daylight exposure than this. But think back to six or eight weeks ago when your life was normal. So these key points that we've highlighted here are some of these peaks that we really do have to be more concerned about. So waking up in the morning, checking your phone first thing, that's an awful lot of light very close to your face that you strictly don't really need. Is that you're meant to have a really gentle wake up cycle where I don't know how many of us actually do this, but not having an alarm set and just allowing the sunrise to wake you up. I do know that that doesn't work for everybody, but there are consumer products now like wake up lights. I have one personally and it's absolutely amazing. Um, when you set it 45 minutes before when you want to wake up and it just slowly ramps up the intensity and the color temperature. It goes from like a very deep red into more of like a 27, uh, 3000 K. And it's brilliant. Having an alarm set is actually detrimental, as Amelia mentioned, is that that sound can actually um, pump up your stress hormones and effectively give you a small heart attack every morning. So you're really kind of shifting where your hormones are immediately when you have your alarm set, turn it off, and then immediately go on your texting or your Instagram or whatever. So that's that's a really delicate place um, in your day. And then hopefully, you know, you get to work and then you're in your work environment that has a very flat color temperature. You're probably not near a window. If you are, good job. But then if you're lucky, you also go outside. You, You take your lunch break and you go and you experience as much as you can as a natural daylight during that day. Obviously, in London, it's not always good, but, you know, more is or sorry, attempting to go outside and getting some amount of light is better than just staying inside completely. And then after work, um, you might go to the gym, you might go to the pub, um, but again, you're under artificial lighting levels, which may be inappropriate for the time of day that it is. Then you go home and you're back on your phone. Good job, right before bed. But actually, this is again, one of those spikes that you're not meant to be at. I think the recommendation, correct me if I'm wrong, is about an hour before you go to sleep, you put down all of your devices and you just try and be in a more appropriate light level. And this is where sort of those sleep wake lights come in is that if you can have that lower, more amber feeling, you try and trick your brain into having its own sunset so that you're triggering that kind of um, the hormones in you to know that it's time to sleep. Again, this is all still very much in study, but the idea of emulating what's happening outside has been a large part of like recent lighting design philosophy. Yeah, I think the uh, the comment there as well about phones and, and tablets having a, a sunset setting where they basically, the, the quality of light becomes warmer. It's very interesting. Um, it doesn't work. It, yeah, the, the, we, we have a spectrometer at work and we tried a few different handsets uh, on people's phones. And whilst the amount of amber light they produce increases, they still have the same amount uh, and the same frequency of blue light when uh, when that sort of, film or filter is is switched on so uh, you know it may be that it's a, a good placebo uh, or that it is just helpful in, in kind of helping us relax um but uh again it's not it's not cutting out the blue light per se yeah if you um if you want to see an interesting anecdotal study of that jonathan rush put on some um orange sunglasses for i don't know what was it a week 
Oh, and no. it wasn't more than that. Um, anyways, yeah, if you guys want to watch it, it's really interesting because it's kind of doing the same thing as you're just putting a filter over everything that you see. And strangely enough, your brain starts to correct for it. Hmm. So ha give, ha give it a look when you guys are done with this. It's really, it's really fun to watch. Brilliant. So here on this graph, we're going to see, as, as Carol was mentioning, the sort of the, the ideal wind down and, and the amount of light. So when we're looking at uh, hospitality or even you know your own bedroom, um, there's stages in the evening where you know if you're in a, a, a lobby or you've got circulation spaces uh, or you're in your living room, you need to think about reducing that intensity of light uh, and slowly bringing warmer colours in. And then on the wind down to uh, you know an hour or two before we go to bed. Uh, that's where we can really start to, you know, wrap those levels down to, you know, to sort of 200 to 50 lux. And overnight, uh, we're looking at cutting out as much light spill as we can. Again, it's more about the disturbance uh, that you cause because we are sensitive to light, even though it's not a hormonal impact. But that will help with our quality of sleep. Interestingly, as you change, uh, you know, as, as we get older, our circadian rhythms do drift. And as a, as a baby, you're, you're basically, you're on lots of disparate cycles, you know, several cycles a day. And we learn to kind of link those together and tie them together into different stages of sleep to get one longer block of sleep. And as we get older, that block of sleep creeps and we become better at waking up earlier or, or worse at sleeping later, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, and then we have our natural um, sunrise level. And as Carol mentioned, the sunrise lamp's an excellent way of achieving that gradual increase in light to kind of add that disturbance in at an appropriate time. Um, but perhaps if you can get automated blinds into the equation, then that's also really helpful. Okay. So we just want to look at a few factors affecting sleep that we have to deal with um, when we're designing spaces for sleep. Uh, you know, there's lots of devices these days with different dials, um, power buttons, standby lights. If you're looking at uh, control plates in the lighting controls in a hotel, they might be backlit and we might want to consider the, the direction of these things. So they can be outside of our field of view, they can be on, but you just don't want them aimed at the individual in bed or somewhere in their field of view. Uh, the same would go for an emergency light in a, in a hotel room. Uh, if it's got an indicator light on it that tells you whether you know that's an emergency light or not, that needs to be um, out of the field of view. Uh, and then obviously we, we're thinking about light spill and controlling light pollution into a space. And it's, it's really uh, imperative, you know, good blackout blinds or considering what's opposite your particular, uh, you know, uh, be it a hotel or, you know, your, your apartment, you know, what kind of level of light are we dealing with and at what time is it pouring into our space? Because it does vary from location to location. Uh, then we've got our behavioral issues. So as we mentioned, phone scrolling, um, the fact that there is still plenty of blue light in our phone, even though you've got that filter on. Um, burning the midnight oil, and I'm sure a lot of people now with the uh, the lack of uh, a kind of trigger to leave work means that we are probably working a bit more fragmented style. So we need a bit of discipline there. And then there's, uh, you know, either travel uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps going out and painting the town red. So again, different hotels are designed with different clientele in mind. So you may have a business hotel, it may be that a lot of your, your clients have traveled, um, and that's, that makes up the biggest portion of your, your client base. It may be that you're a, an attraction, you know, somewhere that you've got a great restaurant or, or bar facility. With, if, you, if you're thinking about the quality of sleep being up there in, in terms of the, the priority of your particular brand, then we need to consider how those environments and how those journeys to your environment um, you know, allow people to adapt for sleep. So Amelia really likes this slide. So this is how much we think lighting has to do with um, and when we're designing something that lighting is the most important thing that we could possibly look at. And we must make sure that that is the primary focus of the design that we're getting into for good sleep. Yeah. It's actually more like that. <laughs> and um, but we also have to remember that there's so much that goes into it. So there's obviously the environmental factors, it's the design of the space that you're doing, the architecture and the fixtures. But actually, what you as the guest are experiencing, coming into that room, being in that room, and then leaving that room are some of the things really do have to be considered. So your age, as Amelia mentioned, really does affect when your sleep cycles are. When you're a teenager, you actually genuinely do need to get more than eight hours of sleep. And your circadian cycle is pushed a little bit further than your parents. 
And then your grandparents would also have a different shift in sleep cycle. You notice that older people tend to go to bed earlier in the day and wake up earlier and take naps to kind of fill in the gap. Well, that's, that's just how it works, is that that cycle shifts over the course of the day. So how do we implement that in a hotel? How do we make sure that that is accounted for? The preceding day, if you sleep poorly, you might want to make that up by sleeping more. That unfortunately, there's not really such a thing as sleep debt, but what you should do is continue to try to sleep those eight hours. And at the preceding day, like Amelia was getting on, you know, if you were on an airplane, then you are going to be shifted by several hours, and your brain is going to take a while to catch up. I believe it's you need one day for every hour that you've traveled over a time zone. So this could be a really long while for some of us that travel internationally. And then we are health and well-being, you know, having – a regular amount of sleep, like on a regular basis, is really what's going to get you as far as you can, is that if you sleep eight hours one day and then six hours the next, that's, that's, that doesn't cancel itself out. If you get less than six hours of sleep, you end up having these micro sleeps in the middle of the day, which are actually really dangerous. You effectively black out for a second, perhaps less than a second. Don't quote me on that. Um, and it's your body trying to make up for what you haven't gotten. So it's actually quite dangerous. You know, th th there's car accidents that happen because of this, which is really detrimental. And again, it, it's shift workers and people like that that are more likely to have this because they've got their circadian rhythm completely messed up because of the way that their day pattern is versus, you know, what's going on in the outside world versus what's going on inside them. So all of these things together have to be considered. You have to think about every single person that walks through that hotel and how they get there and what they're doing. And we'll kind of get into the considerations that you need to have for every different type of hotel that you're working on, sort of what the purpose of it for, who is it for, and what the operator and the developer want. And interesting you're saying there, cares what about the fact that you can't catch up on sleep. Um, it, it doesn't quite work in that way. And we've got a question, obviously, from, from Matt here. I can just see this saying that he's got a pair of glasses that filter out the blue light. Uh, when he's using his computer, is this effective or equivalent of putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound? Um, and really, you know, it, I suppose the way we're trying to get people to think about this is, is it's, a, it's a system and it's, it's a lot of different components. So, um, you know, when are you using the, the lenses? Um, you know, are you getting enough sleep in the first place? And, you know, how does it fit in with, with all of these other factors? Because light is really critical for the hormonal effect. And what we're kind of want to, I suppose, the message we're trying to get across is we're trying to eliminate the, the negative impacts of light um, rather than trying to interfere with people's cycles uh, using light. And if you don't have, you know, if you're not sleeping well and you're hoping that the blue, uh, you know, the filters for blue light are going to help with that, then, um, you know, perhaps that's, that's the wrong way around of looking at it in terms of how we live our lives. And, you know, there may be other factors such as, you know, climate in the room and noise pollution and things like that that we just need to consider. So, again, when we look at it from a design perspective, a particular brand may major on some things more than others. So they may be uh, very design focused um, and they, they might want to capture a certain age group. Uh, they might not be uh, particularly obsessed with travel because perhaps their, their clientele are more locally based. So these things will inevitably sort of slightly reduce the number of tools that we've got available as, to us. And we'll look at some case studies later as to how they've, um, in those projects, they've kind of adapted to that. And then also we have budget. So when we're designing any particular space, we might have some great ideas for how lighting control can automatically, uh, you know, turn on a low level light so that you don't have any issues with, uh, you know, with disturbing a partner when you go you know, for a trip to the loo in the middle of the night. But budget may limit how effectively we can do that and whether we can have a, a custom light or whether we need a PIR to, to bring a, a light on, but only in one space. So, again, we're looking at the easy wins and the practical applications for reducing that, um, that particular impact. We might not have the money for blind control, uh, but we may have the, the sort of the ability to, uh, with one of our clients at the moment, to set a wake-up call and then the from, from the... Um, the concierge desk they can actually set the lights to dim up about five minutes before that wake-up call in that person's room and it's just a different way of thinking around the same problem using the same uh, sort of you know controls and infrastructure that already exist but just thinking about how to service the client more so let's look at a few um sort of key parameters and considerations so we would spoke about cultural considerations um in nordic countries 
uh, again, from everything that we've read, it's our understanding that uh, warmer color temperatures are, are preferred. Um, in Asia and Middle East and North African nations, it's uh, designed typically cooler color temperature of light and also a flatter quality of light. So less contrast uh, and sort of less accenting. Uh, and then sort of in to contrast that in, in Europe, and, uh, Europe and in America, we're looking at sort of moody accent lighting and warmer color temperatures throughout. And then um, as Amelia was saying, is that you really do have to consider who your operator and developer is, is that, you know, if, if an operator has an international brand, kind of what are they looking at? Is this going to be um, a hotel that looks just like the city that it's in? Does it want to match the mood and the vibe of that? Or would it like to look like the same hotel everywhere you go? I think that we've all been to hotels like that where you could be anywhere in the world and you know that you are at that specific brand. So there's the brand guidelines, which we talked a little bit about um, in our last webinar, um, that really affect kind of how a, a operator and developer want to have a message about the kind of um, hotel that you're going into. So you could have a very boutique hotel, which is very specific to the architecture and the design, and it wants to make an impact in that way that might not necessarily be focused on the wellness aspect. And on the budget, of course, I mean, you, you can have hotels like Premier Inn, or you can have hotels Oh, God, I'm not going to name one because I'm going to upset someone if I don't name them. <laughs> um, but we have a whole wide range of budgets and different kind of clients and who they're catering for. So you really have to think of how that money is getting spent and kind of what the guest experience is meant to be based on that cost. And then the length of the, of the stay of the guest, if you're expecting someone to stay overnight because they're there for a gig or something like that, or if you're expecting someone who's on business to be in the country for three weeks, then you have to cater that guest experience very differently because of what we were talking about before is that, you know, the day before really does affect how you sleep and how you interact. And it, it really all has to be taken into consideration. Yeah, I think that sort of familiarity is going back to, you know, the control side of things is really important. If you're, if you're dealing with, uh, you know, tourism and leisure, uh, you know, have to think about things like jet lag, um, perhaps dwell time in, in the space itself, because people may be staying in their room for more or less time, uh, depending on the facilities available and uh you know giving people control over that with business uh, spaces i think you know that fresh start um reliability is really important and again familiarity so people uh you know if they've traveled a long way and they're tired and they've got to be up early in the morning then keeping things very intuitive and very simple is important and again uh, that goes back to how we consider controls and not over complicating it um, and then uh, wellness so uh, what is the focus of the particular brand and you know you can have wellness low tech. I see one of the comments here that you know we could all be living in a forest soon, so none of this will be relevant. So yeah, you can have very low tech, uh, you know, offering where you are linked to nature very much, um, or it can be very high tech. And we will look at an example of a, a very high tech wellness offering uh, towards the end of this. So then when we get into control, I mean, this we reinvent the wheel every time we do a hotel. We get. So many questions about what can we do? It's like, oh, that, that's a lot. There's a lot that you can do. So do you just have dimming? Do you have tunable white? Do you have, you know, Dolly or DMX? Do you have automation? I mean, there's, you could go absolutely nuts with it. But I think what Emilio was mentioning is that you really want automatic blinds, I think, were one of the things that we really push for is that that helps with getting that natural daylight cycle and making sure that you do have some link to the sunrise and sunset. Um, having the dimming over the course of the morning. So I think Amelia was telling me about this project that we're currently working on, where they're going to be a wake up call service in which they will automatically program your lights to help you wake up. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Because it's really interesting. It's essentially, I mean, it's the same process as we, uh, you know, same technology, essentially a Dali controlled system, but it's just giving those control parameters to the concierge and the training as well, uh, in order for them to set the lights to switch on uh, at a time that you know precedes your wake up call by about five or 10 minutes. And I think that's just a really, a really clever bit of thinking outside the box, um, you know, by the design team, just them really pushing for it. And, uh, and you know, sleep uh, is, is a very important part of their brand. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it, we can't really go into too much more detail, sadly, on this at this stage in it, because uh, it's, it's still a work in progress. Um, but yeah, really, really exciting and, and great thinking outside the box. 
Yeah, so there are, there are some brands that are really pushing to help people with this because you can always turn off your own lights and you can snooze your own uh, phone, but you can't have that control when you've got someone else looking out for you. Um, yeah. So again, it's, you know, how complex do you want it to be? What's your target market? So this goes back to what we were saying is that do we have a target market that wants something simple? Do they just want a rocker switch as they enter or a, a key slot for having all the lights on and then, you know, a master switch at the bed? Is that kind of what the target market is looking for when they come into the space? Or are they looking for an automated system that will dim everything appropriately depending on the time of day and to even out a night light so that when you are getting out and you're trying not to bother your partner, you have low level light, uh, both physically low level and illumination low level um, so that you can guide yourself and not interrupt your sleep. So there's a lot of different considerations you can have here with the controls. Um, but the one thing Amelia and I kept mentioning was not having a PIR right over the bed because it's the most maddening thing. Or the, sorry, the indicator light for the emergency lighting and then having a PIR where you can see it just flashing in the background. I think we've all been in one of those hotel rooms. That's a killer. So it's really just a balancing act. It's trying to figure out what your parameters are given to you by the interior designer, the architect, the client, and the brand, trying to make sure that that all fits and that we're still able to do our job in the best way that we can. And that obviously there are some parameters where you know your budget or any other mitigating factors that you've got to look into that might make this difficult. But at the end of the day, we do have to make sure that it's the guest who is getting the best experience that they can and that we're not impeding them from getting a good night's sleep or from recovering from travel or using the amenities in a way that's helpful for their bodies. And so a good way to look at how you would achieve that balancing act is using this kind of simple axis graph of the complexity versus the budget. So we've populated uh, this table here with a few different brands and you know, where we've, we feel from uh, either experience or working with them, uh, they sit in terms of their, their budget, uh, not just for lighting, but perhaps they sort of, they fit our budget um, as well as, as you know, the, the price point and the complexity of the lighting within. So we'll look at a couple of these case studies just to see uh, how that fits in. So we'll start off with uh, Blue Lagoon, now this is uh, this is featured quite a lot in different lighting magazines, and it's by Basalt Architects. And um, I think one thing that really stands out about this is, you know, it is linked to nature. Uh, it is a, a wellness spa um, in in Iceland, and lighting has been very considered in terms of how it's been concealed. It's a very soft quality of light. Uh, it's very in, you know, in terms of it being indirect and and warm but it is still quite a high tech space. And one of the, the key features within it is this, this backlit uh, fabric panel with a sort of sun and moon effect, uh, which changes over the course of the day in terms of intensity and color temperature. So as a, as a guest, you're losing some of that control. You don't get to sort of dial everything up to exactly how you want it, but it is linked to nature. And it's that, um, Again, it's, it's trying not to be disruptive. It's trying to be sort of faithful to what's happening externally. And I, I really, uh, I really love that approach. But again, it's quite, quite high tech, um, but uh, and, and budget, but also very tastefully done. Uh, next up, we'll look at uh, the Ned, uh, based in London, and uh, this is high budget and low complexity. And what do we mean by that? Well. Uh, it's you know it's very sumptuous, very very luxurious space, but the the fit out doesn't rely hugely on uh, integrated uh, lighting and, and lots of technology. It's very familiar. Uh, you know, lights do things which you might physically expect them to do. So they they look like a reading light. Um, they're providing a very warm <clears throat> traditional quality of light, which I think is uh, sort of very helpful. And the controls for these lights uh, are really. You know, considerately placed. Uh, the blackout blinds are excellent in this particular environment and being in central London that's really helpful. But also the lobby uh, or, or the restaurant and bar as well, uh, they, the, the light levels in these spaces uh, really uh, calm down towards the uh, sort of latter part of the evening. So you, you're not going from a really really uh, brightly lit space into your kind of calm relaxing uh, corridor into your bedroom. Uh, the you know the front of house spaces are also calm that you know they're vibrant in terms of life and you know lots of happening there but but the actual uh, light itself um, from a lighting perspective the the quality of light is much more sensitive to sleep which is great to see and again tech not too much tech just lots of clean thinking 
And then we'll look at, uh, like, I like this one from Citizen M because uh, as a sort of uh, lower budget price point, it's, it's really pushing the use of tech. And, uh, you know, they've used uh, color change lighting here in the shower to push their brand. And that's great. I think uh, we just need to be mindful of what wavelengths of light we use and what time of day that particular wavelength is considered. Um, but again, they've used uh, lots of discrete luminaires rather than, uh, you know, one or two really powerful lights. And, you know, the controls in this particular space are sort of intuitive and uh, you know, not overly complex. So they've, they've kind of struck a nice balance from their particular budget point of having using light to kind of reinforce their brand. And Yo, uh, Yotel do the same uh, sort of the same thing. They, they like to give people control over, over color. But they, uh, you know, we've spoken to them about this separately, and that they're sort of they're keen to ensure that they don't detract from the quality of night's sleep in their spaces. So to summarize, um, there's obviously a lot of parameters. So we have to apply this to a diversity of brands, which, like we said, can be quite difficult when you have a lot of constraints. But most importantly, we're trying to provide a framework and have an educational dialogue with everyone that we work with. So we want the interior designers and the architects and the clients to kind of come away from a project having a better understanding of how light affects sleep. And hopefully we can learn something from them as well and that the strategies that they've implemented, like in the project that we're working on where we're trying to have um, a more um, synth a synthesized relationship between sort of the operator and the guest to make it feel very personal, um, that we can take that away and then use that as a suggestion on, different, on other projects. Um, so that we can kind of promote this idea of wellness, even if it doesn't look exactly the same. And to be guest focused, we, everyone is an individual and we all experience spaces differently. I see a lot of people asking about, you know, could we have age-based controls or, you know, could we shift it depending on who the guest is? And again, it's a level of complexity. I don't think you feel super comfortable if someone asks you how old you were when you walked into a uh, hotel reception and go, oh yes, we can cater for that. So there's a delicate way that we can kind of learn how to balance the needs of everyone when they're going into a space. And most importantly, future proofing. And this gets difficult when we're talking about controls. Is that obviously we're going into a world where we're going to have different controls um, protocols and we're getting new technology all of the time that can do all of these things better. But we're designing the hotel for now and the guests of years from now. So it's important to be a little bit forward thinking and to try and understand that things will have to change and shift as our knowledge of sleep and light are get more developed. Great. Another quote from my favorite book. Honestly, everyone should read it. It's really not that dry. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so it's time for us to reclaim our right to a full night of sleep so we can be reunited with that most powerful elixir of wellness and vitality. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Cheers for your time. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Amelia. It was um, a really interesting talk, actually, with lots of information in there. And we've had lots and lots of questions. Um, I did manage to lose them, but have found them again, so it's fine. Had a bit of a uh, a crash in the yeah. middle of that. I saw you leave the room. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the uh, the most important question is from a guy called Paul Nolte, actually. Um, uh -oh. And uh, Kel, I just want to know that if um, if what you're suggesting is that alcohol has a, a kind of a big impact on sleep, uh, are you therefore uh, advocating stopping drinking earlier in the day? Well, okay. So I I have a note about this. I just want to make it clear. So. You should avoid alcohol prior to sleeping because what alcohol does is it suppresses that hormone telling you that it's time to go to sleep. So if you drink too late in the day, I think it's after 3 p.m., similarly for caffeine, is that all it's going to do is the more alcohol you drink, the more it pushes it away. Now, of course, if you give it time to come out of your system, it's going to have less of an effect, but it's not a net zero effect. You can't you know, have a pint at 7 o'clock and then have nothing else and have it not affect your sleep genuinely every bit of it does matter um, and having caffeine after 3 p.m. does the same thing is that you're artificially making your stress hormones a lot um, more active and so you're pushing off sleep in that same kind of way is that you're you're messing with that system so have a pint you know don't don't not during work obviously it's always be aware of what it's doing to your body <laughs> it's always 5 p.m. somewhere Kale, okay? believe me exactly um, <laughs> um, frankly, I need to drink my way through this. Right, okay, um, proper questions now from people. Um, uh, do, 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 let's go through uh, some of these. Um, uh, Joao said, uh, do you think now using warmer white, red, 
uh, and, um, and Mensa, um, or Magenta maybe, and, or other LED chips, and uh, not as before, where people used to call HCL or CW, will be able to get that good cycle using artificial light? I'm bamboozled by that question. Do you get it? Do you think? I, I think oh. so. I think the yeah. question is, are modern sources more effective at giving us a more normal day, night cycle as, in terms of wavelength, I think. And? I've interpreted it. You can answer it. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it's, I don't think the question is whether or not we can impact the, 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 the circadian cycle. I think the question needs to be, do we want to? Uh, and uh, you know, we'll say we'll sort of sound a bit like a broken record, but I think really the 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 focus needs to be on supporting whatever the natural state is uh, for someone at a particular time. And I think where certainly in in hospitality in hotel rooms that we can support that, given that ninety seven percent of the time the rooms are being used are uh, sort of during times that people would be asleep, um, are to sort of not uh, artificially inflate the you know the kind of quality and amount of light that's similar to to daylight that people receive and what do you think about the ethical challenges that you face then around you know playing with people's circadian rhythms or you know and hormone production particularly in places like the, you know, the workplace yeah I, I know that sort of ILD and ILP have, have released statements on this and uh, you know that yeah, I, I think it's something we need to be mindful of, and I don't think it's uh, perhaps in you know, it's getting to the stage where um, you know you need to worry about sort of being sued or anything like that. But um, the more that we find ways to kind of quantify it, uh, the the impact of things, then yeah, the, the more responsibility we have to ensure that uh, that we use. I suppose uh, not just a sensible approach, but a kind of very considered approach to how we, you know, how we put this technology into people's uh, control. And, and certainly, when we're using it in offices, um, and it's just automated, um, it, you know, the, the the sort of intensity and quantity of light that, that we give people, uh, we need a good argument to sort of express that that's um, it's just supporting what's going on outside, and we're not just prolonging at six or seven in the evening, blasting people with you know, with uh, six, 500 lux of, uh, of 460 nanometers of light just to get more out of them. Yeah, and there's also been a lot of studies for kindergartens as well, where they're trying to change the color temperature to make the kids more alert at certain times of day. And I, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but to me, kind of doing that to children is a little bit questionable. Is that, are we trying to make them more productive, like we're trying to make adults more productive during the day? So I, I think like anything in science is you need to be really careful and consider the whole um, of the study that you're trying to do or the effect that you're trying to have. Is that there's a really fine line between trying to assist people in having a more normal day and then manipulating kind of their chemistry. So it, it's a difficult answer is that you, you want to make people's days more normal um, you know, based on our evolutionary chemistry, but you also don't want to feel like you're treating people like a machine. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit difficult. Um, Mike Tan asked, um, can we base um, the, or, or I think what he's really asking is, uh, what are your thoughts on the astronomical clock in control systems? And can we kind of rely on that uh, when mimicking light patterns? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, they're, they're extremely, the, the amounts of light uh, and the sort of quantum of light falling anywhere um, you know, in London, for example, at any time of year is the same year on year. The amount that sort of eventually reaches the ground may vary depending on how cloudy it is on that particular day. But um, yeah, the timings with astronomical clocks are, you know, they're very reliable um, and they're sort of, they're a really good way to sort of, you know, peg when, when the sunset is. Uh, and when sunrise might be, and if you know, if you are somebody that wants to to link their sleep patterns with with that particular metric, then then great. But um, it does vary wildly, you know, in you know, north of Sweden, for example, compared to the equator, uh, sunrise and sunset varies a lot throughout the course of the year, and you might not really want your lights to, to sort of start switching on at three in the morning. Mm -hmm. It obviously doesn't you know, take into account the things you said at the very top. You know, sunrise, sunset is one thing, but direction, weather, mm -hmm. you know, so it doesn't. Um, Anusha asked, um, what is the duration that one needs to expose themselves to natural light to stay healthy? 
Is there a figure? Uh, um, I think it's the it's the cue. So we spoke about the cycle, and there's there's three key cues throughout the day that the body's really receptive to light, um, and that quantum of light. So, um, you know, if, if you can if you can just ensure that you know in the morning between you know as an example between six and eight in the afternoon between twelve and two, and in the evening between six and eight, that the the quantum of light uh, is you know sufficient to give you circadian uh, effect so we'd said earlier that it's over over 1500 lux then you're kind of on the way to uh, creating those triggers at the right time but i don't think there's a substitute for for natural light and i think there's still a little bit more research to go to um you know to sort of keep somebody uh, entirely healthy and martin van is probably who's you know doing our webinar uh next week um it's probably a great person to talk to on this but in order to keep someone healthy in an environment um you know such as the polar polar circles where there is no natural light for long periods um i you know i, I don't think you can do that um sort of indefinitely uh, keep someone entirely healthy without natural light mm. okay. yeah i think the also the thing is to not try and gain it i think a lot of people view kind of the wellness thing as a i'm going to tick this box just get as much light as you can. Go out and have a walk at lunch and try to expose yourself to as much daylight as you can. Mm. Um, yeah, I just say tr try and make your day feel as normal as, as you can as in regards to the amount of light that you're getting. Don't just run outside for 45 minutes and go, all right, grand, and then go back inside. Yeah. You know, the, the more you can be outside and see green things, if you're lucky, um, mm -hmm. the better you're going to feel. Um, so uh, last question, I think, because we're sort of running out of time, but Christina asked, dim to warm or tunable white in hotel rooms? What do you prefer? It's a really good question. My I preference... Would... Yeah, you go. <laughs> well, my preference would be dim to warm. Yeah, me too. Um, just because of when we're occupying the space and uh, creating that that kind of uh, low that quality of light that's sort of very sort of relaxing and calming. Um, and being able to get the you know the sort of setting that's most conducive to sleep. Mm. Yeah, I'm a sucker for that 1800k. Oh mm. man, it's just it's lovely. It's romantic and it makes you feel cozy. And it's yeah, there's so, no there's no replacement. There's the stuff. argument that physiologically it makes no difference. Psychologically, it does. Correct. Yeah, that, um, that's the interesting divide in all this is that you know all of this research comes at a really strange mix of you know like anthropological yeah. and sociological yeah. and physiological like all of it together it, it's it's just absolutely fascinating is that it, it could be a placebo effect right like it doesn't it doesn't matter but if it makes you feel better it makes you feel better yeah yeah well color temperature doesn't have an effect on hormone production it's the quantity of light isn't it yeah um so yeah. it's very much a psychological thing because we've obviously evolved with with candlelight or firelight so um, guys, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Please don't forget, we are back here on Monday next week, not Tuesday. It's Monday the 11th, Magic Movie Moments. It is the, the grand finale. We're going to make it fun. Um, there's some really interesting anecdotes. Um, the team have been working hard on this one. So please do join us. Thank you again for joining us today. This uh, webinar will be uploaded um, by the end of the week onto our YouTube channel and obviously we are currently running our competitions so please do check that out um, the more people enter the better and uh, you stand a very good chance of winning a Mathmos lava lamp thank you Emilio Kale good work well done um, thanks everyone that's it thank you everybody take, take care. care bye thank you